Welcome back, listeners. I wish there was time to jibber-jabber with Ken this week, but we've got some housekeeping to attend to. First off, I want to address the audio quality on this week's episode. Our guest had some technical issues, and it shows, but hopefully you can look past that and still enjoy the episode. Second, we've got some big news coming this week. After seven long episodes, we've decided that our age was starting to show. Well, more so Ken's age. I don't really age. So we opted for a facelift. Keep your eyes out this week. You'll notice an update on both our Instagram page and our podcast pages. We're going to have a new logo, new cover art, and some real Instagram content. So stay tuned because it all looks great. We've also got some exciting guests coming up in the next few weeks and potentially some more surprises. So thank you so much for sticking around, listening to us. We hope to continue this long journey with you. And welcome to Native Tongues. Our guest this week is an academic. He's had careers as a teacher and a Baltimore City police officer, all while writing poetry. He comes to us this week to discuss his wide range of views and his several published books of poems based on what he's seen. Let's welcome Edward Doyle Gillespie. There you go. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Well, uh, where are you right now? I'm good. I'm in Baltimore. Yeah. Yes. Uh, home base is Baltimore, Maryland. Very good. Us too. Do you cool. actually live in, in the city? Yes. We've lived here for over 20 years, and um, we've been in the Hamden area. Oh, okay. The yeah. whole time. Nice. We've got some friends over there. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, neat, a neat place to write, actually. Mm. We've got a really cool creative community here. Yeah, that's how I feel. It's probably like my favorite part of town these days. They've done a lot. So you're from here originally? It's a, no. Uh, so I grew up in Philadelphia. I was there okay. until the age of 18. I went to George Washington University. So I was in D.C. for four years and then we came to Baltimore right, for three years. Went out to Toledo for three years, then came back here okay. and taught at Baltimore Friends. Um, I worked at Hopkins. I went to Hopkins and then I became a police officer here. So you said you grew up in Pennsylvania? Yeah, so um, I grew up in Pennsylvania. My mom was a literature teacher. My dad was a history teacher. And I went to a boys' school for 13 years. Uh, So so such, such, such were the joys, like uh, George Orwell would say. Um, Did I catch you a minute ago say that you taught at Friends? I taught at Friends. I did teach there for two years. Um, So it was literally a public, you know, ICK, British type um, boys private school, a public school. Uh Um, (laughs) But it was, you know, a critical mass of American men. So (laughs) from kindergarten to to 12th grade. So that's, it's been interesting processing who I am because I went to that, I went through school in that environment. In fact, I was thinking of going to Norwich military uh, for college. I got accepted there. And I thought, you know what? I have never been in a normal social environment in my life. Like, I never had a female peer. So I ended up going to George Washington. So it was, it was, it was a neat, oh, it was a neat crucible going yeah. from one to the other. It was pretty cool. It was good. I mean, it was, it was, it was fun. I love, love GW. I think college is wasted on the young, unfortunately. I mean, I wish, I wish You're I could be in that environment now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I would, I would love to experience that now someone's like saying you we've paid all this money you can do nothing but learn i look back right. i'm like what an idiot i was <laughs> oh, so dumb didn't know what i wanted to do you don't figure it out till like you know unless you're going into be a doctor or a lawyer or something it's like your senior year before you kind of focus even until like your 20s at 50 i went back and i read on the road or we've read uh, yeah. on, on the road and i'd read it in my early 20s and i was like oh dean moriarty is so cool sticking it to the man you know and i reread it in 50 i'm like what a homophobic racist piece of crap my gosh 
<laughs> that's just like catcher in the rye yeah <laughs> just like the most miserable character in history you, you know people are looking up to him when they're 18 they're like oh god this guy sucks <laughs> no redeeming values the kid needs meds he needs therapy. Right, yeah. i mean it's just it's, there's nothing heroic it's just yes you're right the, <laughs> gotta let the kids go but you need a lot of help buddy yeah you need <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> did I did I see? So you did uh, ROTC at GW? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. You were going to do military. I was going. I wanted to be a Marine Corps officer. Um, it's funny. There were three of us hmm. coming out of my school. We we'd been at, at that school since we were about five. I think George came when he was in the first grade. So the three of us, probably all of us, some were on the spectrum. Uh, in retrospect, um, <laughs> just looking at our conversations and behavior, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's a lot of therapy we needed there we were just a mess but great guys uh but the three of us craig wanted to be a tank commander george wanted to be a green beret and i wanted to be a, a marine corps recon officer and um okay. we it's an intense group of friends yeah yeah, yeah it was yeah we were we were gonna go hard looking back at it i don't know how realistic that was for those guys i got close i, I got to marine corps officers candidate school and i broke my back oh yeah i've broken it twice now so uh yeah I'm, oh man how'd you do how'd you do that um hmm. obstacle course uh hmm. yeah obstacle course and evidently i had some pre-existing issue and then this the um the rigor of the obstacle Just course did it kind of blew it out yeah yeah but uh, yes i i wanted to be in special operations uh uh were you guys were you all athletic was this just an intensity or like do you think this came from growing up in a boys school yeah we were like the least athletic. <laughs> <laughs> um craig was always obese george was always underweight and um but I, ambitious <laughs> i have yeah you know that was the thing it was like dream big it's like we um my coordination was so bad that when I was in ROTC, marching was a huge crucible for me. <laughs> like just keeping time with someone calling cadence, it was so stressful. My sense of rhythm is horrible. Like music was so not in your that future. That was bad. My co my coordination was awful. I, my God, <laughs> it was. Um, I was very fit. I was very fit, um, but I started playing lacrosse because my coordination was so bad. <laughs> I was like, let me see. Let me just put myself through this and see if I can get any better at this. So, no, the three of us were not particularly athletic. We were very – we were really into gaming um, and science fiction. So we were really into politics and war and weapons, illicit fiction and things like that. You know, um, we liked a lot of uh, Robert Heinlein and, sure. you know, Starship Troopers and stuff like that. Love that one. So such a great book. Yeah, it was great. Great book. Uh, I like to pretend the movie didn't happen. <laughs> I love the movie. Um, really? See, I, I thought the film just was it was just skated along the surface of you know, very just, silly, but it, I, it was entertaining. I liked it. Yeah. Taking it on its own, it was yeah. fine. But it's like after you know, reading the book, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is has so much more to say. <laughs> But yeah, we were we were going to, and we we talked a lot about scenarios, and we speculated, you know, what if a war took place in Mexico? What if there were a revolution? Because this is in the '80s when the big thing was, you know, you had the FMLA in El Salvador, you had the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and we were funding the Contras. Mm -hmm. We had the the narcotics wars going on, and we were like, you know, so I actually was a Latin American studies major at one point. <laughs> thinking that you know we're gonna need to go to war yeah i was like we're gonna probably go to war there and um or like i was like what do you mean the sandinistas were voted out of office but my, my two buddies never even got i mean think craig went to vmi he's gonna try to get his military commission through virginia military institute and he lasted about 48 hours oh, wow. <laughs> yeah he had like a psychological breakdown Thanks. george never got out yeah george never got out of his parents basement from what i understand <laughs> Um, it's a shame. I know a couple of those. I, I hope he at least went somewhere and met women. <laughs> uh, you know, I think he finally okay, did. I think he finally did. Yeah. Good for him. That's good. Uh, it's weird that you had to go to college for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. Finally. That's where I met my wife, actually. Oh, yeah. So I was just going to ask, uh, what's your home life like? Wife, kids? Yes. So my wife and I were both teachers. 
and then I, I was really getting kind of tired of it, not really enjoying it the way I thought I mm-hmm. would, and uh, became a curriculum writer. You're teaching in Baltimore? Yeah, I, I was at Baltimore Friends. Was That was my last time teaching. Friends is a fine school. It just was not, the culture wasn't great for me. Mm-hmm. I became a curriculum writer, so I was writing curricula at Johns Hopkins, a, a foundation through Johns Hopkins called Success for All. Okay. And um, my wife is teaching, and September 11th was supposed to be my first day of grad school. Hmm. And my office mate said, she's on the phone with her fiance, and she said, what do you mean a plane hit the World Trade Center? <laughs> and so I put on BBC, and you know I saw the second plane hit the second tower. Hmm. So I resolved I would become a police officer. Oh. Part of my national duty, national service. Yeah, good for you. Thank you. Um, had you been entertaining that idea? Like, had, was there something in that that you were thinking and that sort of pushed you over the edge? I was pondering it. There was particularly someone, there was someone at work saying, you know, you should think about law enforcement. Mm. You should really think about that. Mm. And um, so I decided I would get my master's degree. I'd earn my black belt and then I would join law enforcement. So that's what I did. Wow. Um, so she's, so we've been in and out of education different ways. I'm interested in going back to the classroom now. Really? Yeah, um, I think I'm I'm ready on a lot of different levels. Higher ed? Uh, you know, I'd love to do that. I'm actually an adjunct professor at a school in Texas, mm. huh. um, which has been a lot of fun. I teach a humanities course oh, there, wow. and that's just great. We do soldier. I have them reading Soldier Needson, James Baldwin. Mm. Um, I'm going to have them read Foucault this year coming up. It's been fun. Um, I have one kid. She is uh, she is twelve, so we're getting through that. I have a twelve, I have a, I have a twelve year old and a fourteen year old. So. I have an eight and yeah. an eleven. Oh wow, <laughs> wow! So you're right in the snake yeah, pit. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, I barely made it down here because I was uh, hanging up LED lights in my eleven year old's room a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she'd be asking me nonstop if I didn't do it tonight, which I did six months ago in our fourteen year old's room. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm not supposed to even acknowledge her room, I <laughs> right. think. I'm not I don't go up there. I'm not yeah, I'm not supposed to even acknowledge certain things. Yeah. Oh my god, Dad. Sanctuary. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's fine. So you also you were doing um police training though too, right? So working through that, getting a little taste there. Would you want to do that forever or like as a full time thing more so? Um, I wouldn't mind doing instruction again, but I think I really kind of miss the humanities. Mm. I really, I mean, I've been, I was having a great conversation about literature and about poetry tonight with someone and just really kind of missed that. So I think I'm, I'm ready to, and of course, you know, I teach, like I said, I teach this criminal justice course. It's a humanities based mm. course, and that's been a lot of fun. That really has. But yeah. Um. I think I'm really interested. You know, I'm a very different person now than when I first taught mm. kids. And uh, I think I'm ready to go back and have a better experience with it, really understand more what's being asked of me and what I can bring to the classroom. And so, yeah, I'm sure police work, especially in Baltimore, is going to shape your worldview quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I have a bunch of questions about that. But to jump mm-hmm. back quickly, your parents were, I'm sorry, in history and literature? And literature, right. Um, now, my dad was a high school principal. He started off teaching history and became a high school principal. So it was a pretty academic household? Yeah, yeah. Um, my mom, in fact, became the assistant head of schools in Camden, New Jersey. Wow. So if we went from Cam- Camden, yeah. New Jersey to Baltimore City, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so she was in Camden. And, um, and, I, you know, it's funny because he, my dad was a principal in a school in North Philadelphia. My mom ultimately taught in Camden. Meanwhile, I'm going to a school that literally had a white picket fence around it. <laughs> and so it was not until I really, I became a teacher in a uh, kind of urban core, inner city Baltimore. Mm-hmm. My first job out of college is doing that. And then, of course, I later became a police officer. And then I really spent like, you know, I'm spending eight plus hours a day in some of the most underprivileged and violent neighborhoods in America. And it was, the culture shock was just unbelievable. Oh what was your beat there? Okay, so Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, okay. Martin Luther King Boulevard. Uh, but mostly Pennsylvania Avenue ran, what did uh, Captain Willard say in Apocalypse Now? It, the river ran like, <laughs> a, ran like a current straight to 
straight to Kurtz. Pennsylvania Avenue just ran like a current through that area. Yeah. That place really kind of hummed with the energy of what we gotcha. did. And um, that really became, that became normalized for us. I mean, the police officers deal with three to 6% of the population. So you're right. very, it's very easy for you to forget that this is aberrant behavior. And the average person there, even if they're poor, they're not, they have mm-hmm. less money than you, less education, they look different, whatever. There are people like you yeah. that just, you know, yeah. They just want to go to the market, get their food, and get home to their kids or whatever. And they're not the people randomly shooting people in the street or committing horrific acts of violence. And Right. But, you know, I mean, we're taking this also from someone who has a teaching background, who decided to get his master's, you know, is focused on education and mm-hmm. helping his country before you stepped into that. I mean, were you the exception? I, I was a bit odd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny when I... You know, my instructors told me later, uh, they said, you know, when you showed up, people were, lots of the guys are saying, hmm, I guess he's just here to write a book. <laughs> uh, he's probably writing a book on ethics or something. And then, <laughs> you and David Simon. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, he's probably doing some work for his PhD or something. And I was like, no, I, they asked me. I was like, no, I, I want to be a wow. cop. They're like, yeah. you know, really what? And I mean, um, was that hard for some people to like sort of wrap their head around, you know, like within the force themselves to be like, what are you doing? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of like, you know, well, why are you here? Well, and then, and of course, for lots of them, it's, it's funny, you know, we always have these kind of, we have a series of semiotic expectations set up for who people are, right? You know, like, well, if you come from this background, you experience, you you expect these things, you do these things, you can do these things, you can't right. do. You are this way. Right. Right. So there's a lot of cognitive dissonance, I think, for lots of mm-hmm. my, uh, my my peers. You know, and there was this, of course, there, there's, always the, there's always the issue of the question of existential violence, right? It's like, yeah. you know, you, you can talk a good game and, you know. And it's funny because I experienced... I, st- I saw the evolution of this thinking in my thinking that, you know, I dealt with a lot of people in the academic world in which I, I mean, would say, you know, okay, what's the problem and how do we solve mm-hmm. it? And there was a lot right. of, oh, I know this idea and I saw this and I know this and that's wrong. And this, okay, so what's your, what's your plan? Mm, There's crickets. Yeah. And it became, <laughs> got to the point where it's like, oh, your main point is just to prove you're the smartest person in the yeah. room. You don't really want to put your boots on the ground and do right. something. Yeah, there's no strategic thinking or right. You know. <laughs> right. And and there's you know, obviously it wasn't everyone. There are some really great people with whom I worked in both fields. Um yeah. in law enforcement, I started I was it was quite re- quite refreshing to have people say, Okay, here's what we have to do and here's how we're gonna do it. All okay. right, let's get this done. All right, boots on the ground, hmm. let's get this done. For some people, for some supervisors that turned into just get it done. Well, sir, what about that? Don't ask me any questions. So, you know, <laughs> and then later it was, oh my gosh, we should have thought of that. Like, well, yeah, we should have. So, right. yeah. So, those obvious. are two completely different worlds. You know, the higher education world of ethereal thinking where everything is contemplative versus instructional, practical. Right. <laughs> Go fix it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the end of the day, there's a, a, you know, virtues and shortcomings in both worlds. Mm-hmm. It's funny because. I did see, you know, I saw some thinking both for towards me and other people of, well, a cop should do these things, behave this way, and you're not doing mm. it. I'm like, well, okay, but am I being a cop? Well, yeah, but, you know, and of course you get that, you, you get that in, in any culture. Right. You know, I remember, I remember when I was, um, when I was working at uh, this foundation, I was talking to some other people there and this one woman she told me how she did kung fu and there was a guy who did seto karate Oops, he did seto karate and uh i said well, why don't we work out at lunch so we would go in the parking lot and we would spar yeah. hmm. and there were some people that were just horrified seems like a pretty healthy way to get your uh, aggression out <laughs> yes but when you're working for some people and i always have to qualify right. it's important to use qualifying statements <laughs> For some people, it's like, well, we're, we're academic people. Right. We're, we're, we're Can't people, be both. We're people of the mind, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, and um, 
so the idea that you would go out and be aggressively physical each other you know hitting each other like my goodness <laughs> someone said that she had a bruise on her leg I go, well, yeah i <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I kept it pretty darn hard, so <laughs> you pretty darn yeah. <laughs> I do Muay Thai oh. now, and I have, oh, a wow. char- have a Charlie horse that I've had for like three days. That one of the guys in the school we just kept kicking each other in the leg. It's, um, it was. It's. So, I, I think love when it. I turned I forty, love, I was I, like, I'm gonna stop kicking people in the leg. That was what I. <laughs> did you did you study a, no, study a, a I'd, I'd actually school? never kicked anybody in the leg so i decided at that point i, was, I, missed, kids, I, right? I missed my window of opportunity to, to kick people so. um, that's great so I, it's funny though from a police standpoint it's like the question would be is it better to have a, a range of different personalities and types you know to be a healthy police force you know or is it or is it better to have sort of more, you know, from a top-down perspective, I would guess they would say, no, we want more people thinking, you know, sort of listen, you know, sort of we're going to tell you where to go and what to do and just going to go and, and do that. I look at the, you know, the model you see with like special operations groups, if they have a diverse group of people with a diverse group of skills. And I mean, we deal with so many I mean, myriad things. And so you end up with, you know, the person who deals well with kids and the person who is oh, more physical yeah. and the person who deals, you know, who came from the neighborhood and someone who's more academic. And, you know, you have to have a mixed bag of talents. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm sure there's people who just couldn't stomach some areas. I mean, just a broader perspective, I hear teaching and I think, Good Lord, like, I don't have the patience to be a teacher, you know, <laughs> I commend the people who are good at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny, because I would hear my parents tell stories about teaching and think, oh, my gosh, I'll never do that. That's insanity. <laughs> it's funny, but um, I think it was while I, yeah, it was definitely while I was, uh, was I walking patrol? I don't remember what I was doing, but my mother, she is, I love her, but she calls and she's whispering. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm under my desk. I'm like, why are you under your desk whispering? The SWAT team is on the roof. I said, oh my gosh, why is the SWAT team on the roof? And why are you whispering? I don't understand. What? And so I mean, there was an active shooter in the area. Oh, okay. Yikes. And there was like SWAT team snipers on the roof. I'm like, why are you whispering? <laughs> <laughs> why are you calling me? Like, <laughs> Right. Why are you calling me? Like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> oh gosh, that's funny. That's wild. <laughs> then that's pretty interesting. I, I like that idea, and I'm. I, I don't know if you know within the system that it was appreciated as much, but I, I think from outside, someone with a more diverse background and is more empathetic and educated could do really well. You know, with all kinds of different groups. You, know, you have to remember that when you whatever you have there gets mixed in with the experiences with the vicissitudes of policing. And I mean, I know that for me, it became extremely stressful. Mm. Um, How are you accepted on the civilian side? Depends on where I work. You know, it was so funny. The way Baltimore is set up, you can be in one of the most destitute developing neighborhoods in the country and five minutes over, you're in one of the most in one of the higher income neighborhoods and so honestly it yeah. often depended upon where i was and who i was like how i was presenting right hmm. at certain points you know if i was having a fed up day <laughs> you know um hmm. i was probably shorter tempered with some people than others and then i you know looking at the way your personal bias works is very interesting right so to say you know when i was in that more working class neighborhood i was often very terse sure. i was often very curt with people you know when I was in the um, the more posh neighborhood, which reminded me a bit more of where I grew up and how I grew up, mm-hmm. you know, where I could talk about this book or that film with someone, and you know, yeah. I could walk into a home and it reminded me of like this is like where mm-hmm. I grew up. This is a lot like my house or my friend's <laughs> right. house, versus walking into say public housing and where my bias, my personal bias, would kick right. in. And yeah, you also I, probably you know, start to you know, I'm sure it was eye opening for you, but you can't not going into there you're automatically going to sort of start to put a expectation on the people there like what they're doing what they care oh, sure. about and those types of things and you start not... to project oh yeah oh yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and I, I saw that a lot in myself where you know you look at a situation and say well this this is the person who's culpable not that person mm-hmm. 
You know, this is what yeah. I'm expecting this person to do, of course, you know. And sometimes you're right. In a way, bias works. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you're wrong. But you should never shut the door. You should never use bias to shut the door so that no, so that you can't let that person in. It's sure. interesting. I wonder yeah. if that actually caused you sort of more more stress in the long run, too, because you are sort of self-aware in that way that maybe a lot of people aren't. You know, they're not thinking about their own bias as they, as they go in. They should be, you know, hopefully now in a better culture we are. Right. But, you know, if you just kind of go around thinking that what you think is right and that you're always, you know, sort of whatever you perceive is right, it makes it a lot easier, right? That's, that's all ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah. Sure. I think I spent a lot of time in my amygdala. At those, you know, those first few years, I think I spent a lot of time in my limbic system. It was interesting as time went on that I became a bit more self-conscious and self-aware and really looked at what I was doing. And like you said, you know, those that humanities background really came back to me. I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, that did a lot for me. So, so when did the when did you start writing poetry? Were you always a creative kid? It doesn't seem like the, your friend group per se were like encouraging, <laughs> or or, the, or your your world domination um, sort of aspirations. <laughs> Military strategy <laughs> didn't yeah. Sort of foster yeah. a you know. And now we're gonna put down our guns and write some poetry. <laughs> I absolutely wrote and read nonstop. Um, I wrote. So a lot of science fiction. I wrote a lot of action stuff. I wrote a lot of pulp. Okay. So <laughs> I wrote a lot of, I read a lot of pulp. I wrote a lot of pulp. Like what were you reading? So I was, I read a lot. I've read some Mickey Spillane, um, uh -huh. but I definitely got into the, <laughs> there's a series called the gold Eagles series. That was the publishing house. And okay. um, so they published a series of books. They're still out. They still come out. They started coming. They started off in the '60s. Uh, a character named Mac Bolan, and um, very pulpy name. Yes, Mac Bolan. <laughs> in fact, Mac Bolan was the basis for the Punisher. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Mac okay. Bolan influenced the Punisher. He looks. I mean, if you look at the character and the way he's portrayed in his background, it, it's it's basically the Punisher. Um, it's Frank, Frank Castle. But the guy who writes, who wrote Mac Bowen, I think he's passed away. He started in the 60s, started writing him in the late 60s, wrote all through the 70s, 80s, and up to now. And he passed away, and the mantle's been passed to other people. So I read a lot of Mac Bowen. And then Mac Bowen, he was enlisted by the, he was a former, so it's almost like you can fill it in. He's a former, you know, Green mm -hmm. Beret and uh, Vietnam who goes on a one-man rampage against the mafia after they kill his family, then um, kind of criminals in general. And finally, he's enlisted by the U.S. government to fight terrorism. Sure. This is in the 80s. So he he pulls together a group of warriors, and uh, he's got Phoenix Force. I loved Phoenix Force. That was my favorite one, Phoenix yeah. Force. It was an, an, inter, an international, multinational group. Um, that went around the world fighting terrorists. And there was ABLE team. They were the domestic group that mm. fought terrorism. Mm. And um, they operated out of this base in, in Virginia. And so I was fascinated by that. I wrote, so I read a lot of Pulp. Like Phoenix Force had like an Israeli, a British SAS guy. He was my favorite character. A, can, a Canadian, <laughs> a Cuban, a Japanese guy. And they, you know, Everything was just like really gratuitous violence, lots of stabbing and shooting in martial arts. And I was like, this is cool. <laughs> and so, um, yes. <laughs> and so, but you know, it's funny at the same time, it's like my favorite movie when I was about 15 years old was like my dinner with Andre. I remember watching and thinking, <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> Not what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> at the same time, I watched Rambo repeatedly, but I yeah. loved my dinner with Andre. I loved Children of a Lesser God. Oh, man. <laughs> like, I watched Children of a Lesser God over and over. I liked Steel Magnolias. I think yeah. that really made my dad concerned. But um, it was <laughs> like... No, Dad, I'm still going to war. Going to war. Don't worry. Don't worry, Dad. <laughs> I want to kill people. It's okay. I just... I'm fascinated by the lives of these right, Southern right, women. Right. Like, what? Um, I was reading a lot of Tennessee Williams. Um, sure. Vladimir Nabokov. I really got into Vladimir Nabokov. I read a lot yeah. of Joseph Conrad. I was fascinated by 
And it, and you know, it, it's not you. It's not really a bifurcated situation. I was interested in conflict. I was interested mm-hmm. in the vicissitudes of being, of being humans under pressure. Mm-hmm. I was fascinated by identity, like the question of what are you willing to fight for? What constitutes your basis of identity? I mean, when I really think about it, a lot of those elemental things really kind of fed through. And, you know, the the pulp stuff spoke to that limbic system need that I had as an adolescent male. So so, um, I wrote a lot of that. I wrote a lot of stuff like that. And um, as time went on, they became, you know, it developed more and more. Uh, and I'm actually I'm I'm I wrote a science fiction novel that I'm editing now. I'm gonna send it off to one of the publishers I've, I've worked with. And it's at, what's the logline? The logline? Yeah, I mean, what's the uh, elevator pitch? Oh, oh, right. Okay, so magic is real. Mythological creatures, legends, magic are all real, and the ley lines that keep balance in the universe are always in jeopardy. If not mm-hmm. for the work of this circle of trans-dimensional librarians, like it. That's cool. This is really pulling everything you've just been talking about together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and they're in conflict with a group, also trans-dimensional amorphous group that seeks uh-huh. entropy. Mm. That the greatest order comes from the destruction and reconstitution of the universe. So. They seek to destroy this magic. These librarians seek to keep it. The magic is given by muses to authors when they're first creating their Mm. work. So the first edition of any number of different books have magical ciphers in them. So in this one, they're trying to find the original 1954 Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's cool. Um, That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. So how long have you been working on that? Like, what's your sort of... This one, I started in the summer. Mm. I started in the summer because it it starts off in Sydney, Australia. And that's where I was through all of July. I was in Australia in July. And um, it starts off in Sydney. And I actually have the main character, like, actually staying in the house in which we were staying, which was right down the road from the oldest pub in Sydney. And she goes to the pub... Uh, I actually used the geography of Sydney sure. in it, and I uh, had a great time developing the character. And it's funny because when I think about the writing that I did when I was a kid, I wrote these these very kind of alpha male, kind of traditional American Western characters. Was that, was that because you didn't know any females? <laughs> you weren't yeah, surrounded, it's not yeah. like you were surrounded by... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't didn't have a lot of you know and and when i did write women they didn't have let's say the most depth um they all came out like jack reacher and chuck norris <laughs> exactly right exactly <laughs> exactly they weren't they weren't quite as dense as the bond girls mm. they were actually kind of useful in a pinch and in fact i did have yeah. a main female character my buddy reminds me of that all the time i did have a main female character a special operative um and he and i still talk about that a lot he said you really wrote her really well and she actually did have i had a backstory for her she came from a military family she grew up in maryland and um so i'm like oh wow that's right and but she actually had some it's funny i didn't know very many women but when i did write women over time they became i had a bit more investment in writing them than my main and now i sit to i sit to my buddy who does my editing I said, you know, I have an easier time writing women for some reason. I, I, I just, he goes, yeah, he said, I think you're kind of bored with guys. You've spent a lot of time with kind of toxic <laughs> men. You've spent a lot of time with toxic men that you don't like very much. It's right the opposite. Yeah. But my main character in this is a, um, she's about my age. So she's 54. She's in her 50s. And okay. so I'm able to make cultural references from the 70s and mm. 80s. She's nice. a librarian who figures out that she can track down these books. She's a bit of a hippie. She's a Quaker, I think, probably. Mm-hmm. And I think she's probably um, at least affiliated. You know, I, mean, I grew up with the um, Quakers. Sure. She, you know, but she's, she's a bohemian. 
um, who's kind of thrust into this world of violence and sudden action and things like that. And it was fun. It's been fun writing her because she refuses to be two dimensional that when I started writing her and I was thinking, you know, okay, well, this is the kind of fish out of water. Oh my gosh, people are pulling knives and guns and I'm a librarian. I don't know what to do. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. I thought, okay, but people are, are more complex than that. There has to be growth in a character. Sure. Right. Yeah. And so I have, she does, I, my friend said to me, you like flashbacks. Hmm. I said, yeah, I think flashbacks <laughs> are realistic. They, we have flashbacks, you know, I mean, I've had literal flashbacks, <laughs> which are not cool, no. but, um, right. and I've had, I had a scene in which she has to think like, you know, how am I going to find the capacity to fight? I grew up with a lot of these characters that were, it's funny, a lot of the stuff in the eighties and I didn't realize it cause I was, I was a kid and I was just really into that very base reactive mindset but mercenaries were a big thing mm -hmm. in the 80s sure. in sure. 80s uh, action stuff and one of the reasons for that in retrospect was rhodesia that um the white supremacist government in rhodesia was running out of soldiers like soldier fortune magazine came out in the 70s yeah. and one of its mm -hmm. purposes was to recruit white mercenaries for rhodesia i did not know that yeah, Neither that was one of its main purposes. And of course, the idea of a mercenary, and their big thing is, you know, we'll, to, we'll take anything but communism. So we'll take, you know, if you're a rabid American racist, that's fine. We'll just, just you know. <laughs> right. And the idea <laughs> of, if you look at a lot of those 80s movies, it was like, you get to the point where like, who is this character why does he even why is he doing what he's doing it's you know we would have lots of the schwarzenegger films it's like okay here's the character here's what his name is okay kill right. people and it's like why does he even care i mean you know, and um, i just finished reading this book called last action heroes that's all about the action stars of the 80s and 90s and really yeah how they influence culture and where that all came from like that you know maximalist machoism and you know mm -hmm. the feuds there yeah, yeah. It, it's really interesting. I would really like to read that um, because you understand there was this undercurrent of having to fight back against emasculation. The idea, I think that the the hates of Vietnam still hung very heavy in the air for American mm -hmm. men. Um, yeah, I mean, and look those, at Rambo. Yeah, right. And those of us that were in our adolescence and were about to assume the mantle of American manhood, you know, mm -hmm. And it was like, you need to do something. We need to, you know, we came out of World War II feeling, you know, the American man has affirmed right. himself. And then, right. you know, in 1975, and it's funny because I remember thinking, I remember my father and mother talking about Vietnam and my dad, my, my, my mom was like, we didn't need to be there in the, to begin with. This was disgraceful. My dad was like, you know, it was, there was something, that, there was a great sense of opprobrium that, this developing world people had beaten mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. you know. And then I remember the hostage situation in Tehran. Mm -hmm. It's like, once again, this country that didn't have an aircraft carrier, right. you know, could right. hold us at bay. And thinking, you know, wow. Yeah, it knocks you back on your heels if you're that stoic figure who was used to the black and white lines of yeah. patriotism and, you know, this is the way things work and we're number one. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I remember it was in, must have been 81, 82, when um, Arabic separatists took over the Iranian embassy in London. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I thought, well, here we go again. You know, these these people with, you know, low technology, but a lot, but more will can do what they want. And then as I, I watched the news reports and along the balcony come these guys in black mm -hmm. fatigues with balaclavas and heckler and Koch mp5s which i immediately recognized and you know they threw grenades through the windows and repelled and went and shot the terrace and i was like i don't know who those guys are but that's where yeah, that's where i want to be up. yeah you know, <laughs> yeah. it was you know that was the british sas and then there was the falklands war right after that i was like wow britain gets stuff done okay but, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's funny to see the directions that you both moved in um and, and you tied them together really well like i said a minute ago but everyone always says write what you know and 
you know, when you throw out that elevator pitch of this wild fantasy world <laughs> on the surface, it sounds outrageous and, you know, yeah. just like this total world building mythology thing. But it really lines up with what you've been talking about <laughs> at the economic world versus the uh, visceral, the practical yep. take action world. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, just it, it's uh, everything you're mentioning right now. You know, it sounds like you've paid attention to the world around you the entire time. And there's tidbits in there. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's obviously like the mind of a writer. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. it's interesting. Part of me writing was like, what am I talking about here? This is crazy. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have a question. So when did you start to share your poetry? When when did you say, you know what? Somebody else should hear this too, you know? So it's funny. Day one of the police force? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that <laughs> came later. That came much later. I mean, it was like when I was writing in, I mean, when I was a teacher and I was writing poetry, sending it in, actually even before, yeah, that's why I was a teacher and a museum curator, sending it in to um, contests, okay. trying to get published. That mm -hmm. goes back to like 1992 or so. Okay. And I started winning awards. I won a few awards, was published in a few mm -hmm. magazines. That was fun. I started taking it a bit more seriously. Yeah. Um, once I got onto the police force, I continued writing. I think I wrote a bit more escapist stuff for a while. But then I got to the point where I wanted to write cathartic pieces. I tried to write some police mm -hmm. pieces, and that just it. I struggled with it. It was funny, and I think part of it was my mind just didn't want to go there at that right. point. Right, just too much of what you're actually um, doing. Yeah. Like you're you're so exactly so close to it that it's actually yeah. But um, so over time, I've progressively shared it more and more, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, a few years ago, while we were still having Book Fest down on the promenade in the Inner Harbor, um, I think someone had gotten wind of the fact that I was writing. And so they did a little piece on it, on my books, on my, on my, on my, my writing. And um, that was that was neat. you know. And I finally felt like I was willing to. It's funny because I was already kind of seen as a bit odd. So, um, <laughs> you know, so no one was like wildly taken aback that I was writing poetry. Right. <laughs> They're not surprised. Right, right. It's interesting though, because I feel like you're, uh, you know, it obviously colors how you view um, the looking at just the police work and stuff you're doing on the day to day through that lens. You know, did you find were there things that um, where you're looking at something and saying, "Oh my god, I need to this this is going to come up later," you know, or something you're going to process? Oh, absolutely, you know? yeah. Uh, it it really fueled a lot of my writing and very psychologically cathartic, and also I just wanted to make a chronicle of a lot of the things I was yeah. seeing and doing. I just wanted to hmm. say, you know, wow, I actually saw that. Or that actually happened. Um, or this seemed like it was, cre this scene was created for me to write about it. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it definitely fueled my, fueled my work. Could you see your, your voice? Could you see your, your voice change over the course of your police career? You know, sort of a, as you are, Mm -hmm. I saw my voice change. I definitely saw, like, well, I'm looking at the writing that I'm doing now. I mean, there's always the question of how autobiographic the the writer's voice is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I definitely, I, I wrote one piece that used um, a homophobic slur, and someone said, my gosh, I can't believe you, you said that. I said, well, did I, did I say it, or did I just write it? You know? Yeah. Um, I said, you know, this is, you know, this, and I, I, I got into a conversation with her and I said, well, did you know that I, uh, cause she was like, well, you wrote this, you said this. And I said, how many years do you think Bob Marley got for killing a law enforcement officer? <laughs> and she said, what are you talking about? He didn't kill a law enforcement officer. I said, oh, so Bob Marley <laughs> didn't actually shoot the sheriff. <laughs> okay. So I was going to ask about the um, poetry aspect of it. And I think you explained it a little bit, but just in the sense that poetry is traditionally a more stoic, serious form of writing that's a little more, it's just not so straightforward. Right. You take a word or a concept and you put that into, say, instructional writing, technical writing, law, mm -hmm. government, that word has a meaning, Right. It's meant to convey a concept. It has a meaning. When you put that word into poetry, it might be it might become a contronym, 
right? It might try, it might represent more than one concept at one time. It might create tension within the poem. You know, there's probably myriad reasons why you would use that word and what it means. And so, right, there is definitely a contradiction between the way you use language in those two cultures. So it really is more about the like construction of it that interests you. It seems like because, you know, up to that point, you're talking about reading pulp and writing uh, science fiction and fantasy and all these, you know, more grandiose, uh, not lighter, but just fiction. I mean, I, I would imagine it's hard to jump back and forth between those two styles. You know, it was it's really interesting that, you know, as, as we're sitting here talking, it occurred to me that uh, at the same time that I was writing this stuff and really like, I mean, like had a subscription to Soldier of Fortune and just loved reading articles about far off wars and stuff. I had like a yeah. box set of Maya Angelou's mm-hmm. poetry and um, I, I just read it from cover to cover to cover to cover. And like I said, I read, oh my gosh, I got into Vladimir Nabokov. 1987, I started reading Vladimir Nabokov and just became entranced by his work. I think that's a pretty typical arc for Soldier of Fortune readers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> they were always talking about Maya Angelou and Soldier of Fortune. It was just... I, I, I actually just get it for the poems. I don't... I'm not... <laughs> I don't know, yeah, guns. yeah. I, think, but... <laughs> I do think, though, it seems like you're... They, uh, I don't know. It's like your, your path is very uh, non-traditional. But it, it actually feels kind of straight for like straight like you you know you all were always sort of in these two worlds and and moving forward in that way you might have gone you know deviated a little bit here or there but you always sort of ended in this sort of creative you know juxtaposed to that visceral but like it, and it seems like that you know like you're just saying is as a contradiction it seems like a contradiction but in actuality mm-hmm. it's like it's always been kind of you running in that same stream or whatever i don't yeah. know why you're running i think i always kind of no right? like i always kind of related to wilfred owen i think i was always kind of taken by wilfred owen and a lot of the world war one poets who you know they went to schools like eton and cambridge and they you know they were schooled in the classics and um and yet they made their mark as chronicles of war mm. that's not often present that's not a pop culture um, there's not a pop culture trend there. There's not a pop culture vibe with that, but it was yeah. very much the case in some cultures. There's, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that that's very much an American kind con- not a Western contradiction. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are some mm-hmm. cultures in which the idea of the warrior as being a scholar, being a poet or a philosopher is, you know, it's considered part and parcel. Um, you know, the samurai, of. um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or at least our our the archetype we have of a lot of them, uh, but yes, that's very true. It's it's been pretty consistent um, with me. You said you wanted to become a police officer after nine eleven. I mean, mm-hmm. that seemed like a big moment that you know much of the country was looking for answers and you're feeling the patriotism drive them towards the military, towards police work, toward something to stand up and defend their country. I mean, obviously, there's a big part of that in there, but do you think there was also part of you that just one of the experience, like, oh, sure. uh, you know, for what you read about, like for your writing mm-hmm. to just oh, sure. kind of oh. expand your worldview. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there has to be, you know, there has to be that moment that, that fuels your, that fuels your wolf in whatever you do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to look at it. It's almost like if you're making an argument, you know, Aristotle said you have what logos, ethos and pathos my country needs smart, strong people to fill a role to protect it internally, you know, and at the same time, is this the type of work I want to do? Because it seems viscerally exciting. I mean, yeah. And um, so, yeah, yeah, I I, I think it did serve that certain purpose for me. Yeah. So, I mean, you almost just answered it for me, but I was going to say at this point at the back end of your career, I mean, do you feel like you, it doesn't seem like you were looking for achievements, but do you found what you were looking for, in terms of people, in terms of storytelling, in terms of uh, content, like something to fill your brain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. On, on more levels than I would have thought. Um, yeah. And I'm was, not saying they were all good. I mean, I'm sure there were some dark, really difficult parts of police work. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of rewarding parts, but 
And, you know, and it's like, you know, poetry does not have to be beautiful. Yeah. It, you know, and the things that feel it don't have to be beautiful. Um, it has to be true and it has to be real. And I think that's where policing has definitely influenced it. So, yeah. Interesting. There's so much going on here. But uh, yeah, like Ken said before, I like that it was a straight path forward that just kind of absorbed all these different pieces along the way. Right, right. So we didn't get the name of your book, science fiction book you're writing. Oh, I, I'm not sure what the title is yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, the main character's name is Maggie. And uh, so okay. I may name it after her. But um, I, have a, I have a steampunk trilogy that my buddy oh, yeah? is helping me to edit. And then I'm going to probably just name that after the main character whose name is Solstice. You've written the trilogy already? Yes. <laughs> and haven't published the first one yet? I wrote... I thought it was one book and I <laughs> sent it to my friend and he said, you know, this is three books, right? This is absurdly long. I was writing it over a period of okay. years. Yeah. Just writing, 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 writing. And um, he said, yeah, we're going to have to break this into three <laughs> books. So, well, now uh, you can read one like every six months and look like a really prolific writer. Exactly. He's just working. <laughs> working <right now. laughs> That's cool. So what else have you got? These I've written several poetry books. Mm -hmm. I've got poetry books out on the market. So my most recent one is um, Father of the Red Grotto Used Bookstore. And I've got one called Aerial Act. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got one called Gentrifying the Plague House. Uh, one called Socorro Prophecy. So these are all collections of, of poetry that I've done, published through a few different publishers. Okay. Gotcha. They weren't independently published? No, I had, I did that with one book, one book. And I had actually picked up a publisher and he just vanished. And my friend was like, just publish it yourself. So I did that. But since then, no, I've had, I've been picked up by um, three different publishers. Fantastic. Good for you. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, I, I've got another question too that, I mean, it just, it looks like we're kind of getting late and I don't want to hold you here all no, night. Right. But we usually like to ask about a hometown, like mm -hmm. to take us back where you started sure so you've been in baltimore for a long time i'm gonna go out on a limb and say you don't think of toledo as your hometown <laughs> toledo no not really. <laughs> i've spent some time there it's uh yeah, i don't know if there's enough to discuss <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, met, I met some great people there i had some good experiences but yeah it sure. was it was, nice it was it was short-lived yeah okay so here let me jump ahead the question is if you were to take a new friend an old friend someone you're trying to uh, show off the town for a night and really have a good time with, where would you go? Here in the city, here in, in Baltimore. Well, which uh, city would you call home? And I would, I would where say, would you want to go out for the night? I would say Baltimore. I've just been here longer. Yeah. Um, my goodness. So going out, we would, pr you know, I would pr probably say. How about that? Let's expand it. You're picking up your friend in late morning. So you've got daytime as well. Uh -huh. Great. It doesn't just have to be bars, clubs, restaurants, but we want to know all that stuff. Coming uh, to Hamden, um, yeah. the neighborhood of Hamden here and visiting some of the store, the bookstores and uh, the restaurants. That's definitely one thing. Um, Which ones are you going to pick out? Ah, so there's Charlotte Elliott bookstore and Atomic Books bookstore. Um, the Ooh, Ivy. I like Atomic Books. Yes. Yeah. The Ivy, which is um, out of the neighborhood, some it's farther down the road, but definitely mm -hmm. very close. I love that. So those are some great bookstores to pick up. Um, the uh, we've got a few Southwest Cafe, Southwest. Um, there's a Greek restaurant, and um, so we've got a few cute, cool places like that around here. So I think those. I think those. I think you can definitely. There's a great community around um a lot of the independent bookstores and so you can go there and just have a really great conversation and experience the culture of the other people that like to read are you a coffee drinker i am i am okay. uh one of my my rituals for my my morning my morning writing is um I make a cup of coffee and uh i'll do writing sprints it's like i'll do a, i'll meditate and then i'll do a writing sprint where it has you write for like 20 minutes straight and then it ding you know and um yeah. i'll drink coffee while i do that definitely but yeah i like coffee a lot what kind how do you drink it black yeah me too yeah 
See, I, I don't like black coffee because, uh, and it, I'm just, whatever, I like sugar and cream. But I also feel like, <laughs> I also feel like it puts a lot of pressure on the coffee to be good. Because if, if the coffee's terrible, you can still add cream <laughs> and sugar to it. And you're like, okay, it's fine. It's tasting whatever I want it to taste like. <laughs> but, if, but if it's crap, you're like, all right, well, that's what you got. That's <laughs> right. It's motor oil. Oh, well. <laughs> all right. Diner coffee. So uh, I, you started to allude to it a little bit, but the, the process of writing for you. Um, so you are a diligent sort of workhorse method uh, sort of writing, it seems like? Yeah. So, okay, my, my wife chides me about this. With, mm. I have to have gel pens. Cool. Right? Okay. And <laughs> my family has been awesome that they know I need to have journals. So what I'll do... This is really neat. This is something I really enjoy. I'll get a nebulous yeah. piece of what the poem is supposed to be. It'll, and I will literally write, it's really hard to see, but I'll write like across the lines here. Okay. Right. Lots of notes. Just for anyone who's listening, we're looking at pages of his journal and it almost looks like shapes <laughs> made out of words. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like back and forth, back and forth. So what I'll do, so then... It looks a bit more formal. Okay. It's now starting to look okay. more like a polished. And you have a few edits. <laughs> more traditional. A few edits written yep. across on the facing page. And then I do that again. And again. Oh, wow. And again. So this is one poem that's going on for several pages over and over. And I keep, as soon as I make an edit, I go back and rewrite the whole thing. So the whole process. that's where I kind of let it roll. Mm -hmm. You know, let it run. And I read Annie's Nin's book on the on the new novel. And one thing she talks about is how a writer, how some writers get to the point at which they have that genuine moment of whatever the impulse was is translated directly into what they write. Because there's always that issue of I have the impulse that how do I get this through language? How do I structure yes. language to get it there? And that in many cases leads to the lexical difficulty of the poem i think i'm really mm -hmm. i've become more and more conscious of that that like okay what what references do i need to use that will spur the writer to let me spur the reader mm -hmm. right to maybe go back and figure out what this is how does this relate you know let me dig deeper into this term or this word this uh, you know because there has to be a certain i think a certain unfamiliarity to the language that you use to allow for that heavy lifting. So because poetry is like music, it's often in the way you hear it. Do you have anything short that you'd want to read before we wrap up? Not to put you on the spot. I think I do. Yeah, that'd be great. Let me see here. So this is from my book, Aerial Act. This is called The River Had a, a Part in It. The river introduced them one to the other. It took communion from them took them apart as it would topsoil after a rain and wash their stories downstream this was how they knew one another when the time came for leaving this was how the one who had been broken with axe handles folded and packed away in the dirt of an earthen dam for speaking out of turn heard the story of the child who was weighed down with a cotton gin wheel and tossed from a skiff that the old men used for, for fishing. The river introduced them and was gracious and kind as it mingled them, because this was the South, and no one should travel alone through the weeping of the gulf, the blindness of the mud, and out to the freedom of the ocean salt. Wow, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah, that that was interesting. That took a, a sharp turn at the beginning. It was light until you got into the part with the axe handles, and then suddenly it was very visceral. It sort of ends in a hopeful kind of, it's like going through the crucible and then ultimately finding freedom, and hopefully. Yeah, that's good. Uh, love it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you for reading that. When do you think we can expect your sci-fi book? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it were this summer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. We'll keep an eye out for it. Before we let you go, is there anything else you wanted to throw in? Got the Plug? new book out now. Um, Father of the Red Grotto used bookstore, and um, it's uh, it's making the rounds. Awesome. And um, 
just going to keep reading and reading and writing. Thank you guys keep so, working. so cool. much. It's been fun. It's been fun. Really Very much. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Very great. cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great evening. Take care. So nice All to right, meet you. You too. Take care. Very nice meeting you. All right. See ya.